I'm Mr. Mega Man Fan, and today on Homebrew Review, we're going to be talking about Seawolf for the Atari 2600. Now, I have a few, not many, but a few memories of playing this in the arcades when I was little. It's a midway arcade game, and it has a very novel control scheme where you actually have to look through a periscope to sight the enemy ships that you want to sink. Needless to say, this was unwieldy for a little kid who could barely stand tall enough to reach an arcade cabinet controller, let alone look through a periscope. But if you had a stool you could climb up onto, it was theoretically possible, but I spent much more time playing the Commodore 64 version when it was released on home consoles. And this continues that tradition, although I would argue it maybe does it in a more accessible way. Because when I played the Commodore 64 version as a kid, it required paddle controllers be plugged in. And this one, you can play with any old Atari VCS 2600 compatible joystick with the 9-pin connector on the end. Just plug it into port 1, put the Seawolf cartridge in, and you're good to go. Or, if you're playing this in emulation, you just want to have your controller plugged in the USB port and configured for a retro arc or open emu or whatever you happen to be using because again it's plug and play you just hit the fire button and off you go you're shooting down enemy boats and you want to be careful with those shots because sometimes you can shoot at something that will reflect your shot back like red cross ships you don't want to shoot those down so naturally you get warned hey you're shooting at something you shouldn't be, it's coming back to you. Sometimes that can actually work to your benefit though. If you're trying to hit something that's moving really fast and it reflects off, it can bounce right back into the enemy ship that you were trying to hit and you score more points. And that's one of the two ways with which in the difficulty of Seawolf lies. The first is that the ships you're shooting move at different speeds. The second is that there are obstacles in the way of those ships their bombs, their seaweed, whatever they are, they snag your torpedoes and blow them up. So you have to avoid both the targets that you don't want to hit and aim at the targets you do want to hit. And as they famously said in an episode of Futurama, you were shooting at where I was instead of where I wasn't. I'm misquoting that, I'm sure, but it was the same idea with Space Invaders where when something is moving, you have to fire before it gets there to intersect it by the time it arrives there. And the faster they're moving, the harder that is to do. You might be tempted to just fire blindly and hope that you can hit something, and I have been known to get desperate and do that at times in Seawolf, but if you run out of torpedoes, you lose a life. And if you don't hit enough targets in a certain amount of time, you run out of fuel. And in this game, fuel is also a life, so, you have to score enough points to get the refuel. It's a little white symbol to appear. You shoot that symbol, you get more fuel, you get more torpedoes, and it's the equivalent of hitting a checkpoint in a racing game, like say pole position. You need to hit that checkpoint in order to keep playing or you lose a life. And when you lose all of your lives, or in this case, submarines, then it's game over for real. It's not just you lose a life, it's you don't get to continue and your score at that point is whatever your score is going to be. Is it your high score or not? Well, the one way to find out is keep playing and keep track. Get a little pen and pad and write it down or if you're using an emulator and save states, then record the screen when you get to that point and you'll know that you got the high score. There's one of the refuels that I was previously mentioning. So I found this game endlessly fun even with the sometimes jittery paddle controllers of the Commodore 64 which were only made worse by a video pinball game that I frequently played and probably abused the hell out of those paddles on by twisting all the way to the left and the right as fast as I could to move my paddle which functioned as flippers in that game. So you might be saying right now as a viewer this looks incredibly simple and I'm not sure why it's a homebrew review that's worth pointing out. Well, that simplicity is deceptive. 
First of all, even though this is an arcade game from 1976, this version of it is in full color. And if I remember playing it in the arcade, you were looking through a sight at a screen that was black and white. So this is closer to the Commodore 64 version than the arcade version released by Taito. And the fact that there are multiple color striations on the screen, including a very gorgeous sunset at the top, is quite an advanced technique for Atari 2600. Displaying this level of graphical fidelity is not typical in major mass-produced commercial games, let alone in homebrew games. Take GoSub. Remember that game? Remember that homebrew review? Remember how simple and tedious and blocky those mazes looked and how boring and repetitive that game became over time? Well, this one is colorful and fast-paced and continues to be fun long after the first 10 minutes that you played it. The simplicity is complexity because the graphics are way beyond what most Atari 2600 games were capable of. I'm talking major releases like Pac-Man, which was a flickery mess. I still like it, but let's call a spade a spade. That is what it is. And Space Invaders, which we've also talked about on this channel, famously looked nothing like the actual arcade Space Invaders, and it took homebrewers to make that a reality. So for this to be so close, at least in my memory, to what playing the Commodore 64 version was like, and using arguably better controls than the Commodore 64 version did, and even adding some complexity that I don't remember that version having, including these landmines that you have to avoid and these hospital ships that reflect your torpedo shots back at you. Well, I might even argue this is the superior home port of Seawolf because other than Commodore computers, Atari computers, and this homebrew release, I don't know of any other versions of Seawolf nor any that I would want to play more than this particular version. This is a highly commendable effort, which is why if you go to Atari Age right now, you can buy either the loose cartridge for 25 bucks or a complete in-box copy for $40, which comes with the cartridge box and a beautiful full color manual, all because this game programmed by Manuel Rushkar is a work of art. It deserves its praise and recognition. And if you saw the opening sequence that I recorded off a screenshot on my computer, it has earned it. Reviews ranging from 70 to 100% on Atari Age with a weighted average of 89%. Maybe I should write a review of my own and bump that up a little more because I would definitely give it 100%. If you're looking for homebrew games to play on your Atari 2600, this is definitely one to own. You don't have to take my word for it, though. There is a demo ROM available, and as I always say, fire it up in the emulator of your choice or put it on the flashcard of your choice and take it for a spin yourself. And then if you like it, delete that and buy the full game or buy the full game and keep that as your backup. Either way you want to go, it's not going to bother me. I'm Mr. Mega Man Fan. This has been Homebrew Review with the Atari 2600 game Seawolf. Thanks for watching.